Good evening. When, when Jerry described the conference, I was thinking to myself, you know, this is the triathlon of peace conferences. By the end of the weekend, we should all receive some kind of sweatshirt or, or something that uh, says we survived it. Uh, as I was introduced, I, I'm with U.S. Labor Against the War. And as you know, we have a, a rather special relationship with the Iraqi labor movement. Uh, we sent the first U.S. delegation to Iraq just months after the invasion in the fall of 2003 and brought Iraqi delegations here in 2005, 2007, 2009. And we also sent a delegation, which I was privileged to lead, to Iraq for an international labor conference in March of 2009. One of the Iraqi trade union leaders who was the first to come to this country in 2005 is going to be with us this weekend. I'm not sure if he's here yet tonight. Is Amjad Ali? Amjad Ali. Amjad. Amjad is a North American uh, representative of the General Federation of Workers, Councils, and Unions of Iraq and the Iraqi Freedom Congress, and you'll be hearing more from him uh, in the workshops. Although the war in Afghanistan and the attacks in Pakistan have been the focus of a lot of attention of late, we can't forget that the illegal occupation of Iraq has not ended. And the withdrawal of combat troops next year, even if it is on schedule, will not end the occupation. It remains our responsibility to remove the boot of foreign occupation from the necks of the Iraqi people. And to make that point graphically clear, I want to share with you some deeply troubling recent developments that illustrate the urgency of that responsibility. Following the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, the U.S. kept in place Saddam's 1987 decree banning unions in public, uh, in public sector workplaces fully 80% of all the jobs, including the oil industry. Even though the new Iraqi constitution requires the adoption of a basic labor law, and Iraq is also signatory to the ILO Convention 98 on collective bargaining, the newly elected government in Iraq continues to enforce that law and has added additional decrees, including freezing all union bank accounts and assets. More recently, the Iraq regime escalated that war by banning all foreign travel by union leaders without the expressed prior permission of the government, punitively transferring militant leaders of worker actions to remote locations a thousand kilometers from their home and from their union base, and filing criminal charges against the two top officers of the Oil Workers Federation for undermining the Iraqi economy by uh, opposing and actively organizing against privatization of oil resources. If they're convicted, they face three years in prison. Just this week, the Ministry of Electricity, which is now headed up by the Minister of Oil, issued another draconian decree it prohibits all trade union activity and, and, and ceases all form of cooperation or communication with unions in all their workplaces. It directs management to help the police to enforce the closure of all union offices and the confiscation of their property. It orders all enterprises to take immediate legal action against anyone who threatens the use of force or causes any damage to public property, and it orders all departments and enterprises to repeal any benefits that the unions previously negotiated. This week, the armed forces of Iraq and the police raided all of the electricity union offices in the country. The workers of Iraq need and deserve our solidarity, and we announce tonight that US law and the IVAW, the Iraq vets, are going to be circulating a letter to Congress asking them to sign a letter that goes to the Iraqi government and to the President of the United States and Secretary Clinton to register their opposition. 
Now, I'm, we, we have submitted a resolution on this, and since there's speakers going to be uh, a lot of minute on that resolution, I'm going to take one extra minute and talk about something else. The call to this conference was signed by more than 30 organizations, and U.S. law was one of the earliest. It sets forth the objective of uniting the movement in action while respecting our diversity and differences in political program and ideology. The conference was called in response to the stark reality that no single organization or coalition can claim hegemonic leadership of this movement, and none is capable of ending these wars on its own. The truth is that we need one another. But more to the point, the people in the countries targeted by U.S. aggression need us to be united in order to end the tyranny that they suffer with daily. Working people, the poor, racial, ethnic, and religious minorities and young people in the U.S. also need a movement that puts united action ahead of partisan political, ideological, or organizational advantage. I hope our deliberations this weekend are characterized by a sincere effort to find common ground rather than the zealous pursuit of political purity. Let us recognize but be tolerant of our differences. Let us identify where we can cooperate, be mutually supportive, and act in the interests of the broad movement, in the interests of oppressed peoples everywhere, in the interests of peace and social justice. Thank you.